So this is a Charmwood Forest Railway. Oh, that sounds pretty. But it's not the subject of today's video. We're only here for a very short time as we head that way to tell a story of a really early railway with some very quirky features. Mm, we like quirky. We like quirky. This is the Grace Dew, Grace Dew Viaduct. I know, I had no idea how to pronounce that. The Grace Dew. It's written down here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, which is lovely. And I figure it would be a lot better in the winter when you can actually see it. Yeah. It's a bit overgrown at the moment. Yeah. Right. Um, we need to head that way. Okay. So we managed to find our way down to the bottom of the viaduct and actually it doesn't need to be winter does it to see it it's very beautiful yeah it's just more up top i think big trees yeah, yeah it's lovely Gorgeous. wonderful so we're heading to our west of here and we're heading towards the swannington and leicester railway now in the early 1800s there was a huge rivalry between the coal masters of the time between leicestershire and nottinghamshire and that railway in particular tells that story so well with a number of quirky different aspects to it so join us as we head towards Leicester so third and final stop on the Charmwood Forest Railway is something that's potentially a little bit um I say special to us, is that the right word? Yeah, kind of. Witwick. It's not Witwick. <laughs> it, it is if you spell it. It looks like Witwick, it but I like think Whitwick. it's pronounced Wittick. Wittick, yeah. Same as the W-I-G-H-T, so it's got a similar <laughs> surname to us. It's Wittick in Leicestershire, and it's very beautiful, and it's right in front of us. Mm -hmm. Okay, there is Wittick Station, now used as a local heritage and History Centre, which is kind of ironic because they do genealogy. In they there. do. And our surname is very yeah, similar. Works, very exciting, isn't <laughs> it? Right, we're still on the track bed, but we're not. We're about three feet above the track bed because the platform would have been here where the grass is now. And uh, we're now going to head on that way to today's main event. So the Nottinghamshire and the Leicestershire coal rivalry. Well, Nottinghamshire in the early 1800s always had the advantage. Why? Because they had access to a canal network so they could ship their coal wherever they wanted to fairly easily and fairly economically. Leicestershire, however, didn't. And they were stuck in the rut, let's say, the, the horse and cart. And you can imagine the differences between those two methods of transport, muddy trackways in the winter or a nice smooth but slow canal. One such coal master was that of William Stenson. He sunk a pit just down the road here in Long Lane and found coal in 1820, thus the birth of the town Coalville. But he still had the issue of moving his coal. Now Stenton had seen the success of George Stevenson on the Stockton and Darlington Railway and he was now building the Liverpool and Manchester Railway, both carrying passengers, which was quite unheard of. Stenson wanted a piece of this railway action for himself. William Stenton managed to raise £60,000 in the first meeting about this railway. Now George Stevenson was obviously very keen because he raised another £40,000. 1830, royal assent is given. Now this is only the fifth railway of its type to be given that royal assent. 1832, all is set to go. George Stevenson himself drives a train called the Comet out of Leicester up the line into the Glenfield Tunnel. Now the Glenfield Tunnel has been over ballasted. The track bed's a bit too high. Subsequently, the chimney stack ends up hitting the top of the tunnel and collapsing. So Stevenson carried on going through the Glenfield Tunnel, probably between 15, 25 miles an hour, unperturbed by the loss of his chimney stack. And he came across along here, across the Rovery Brook. Now, 
You can imagine, after going through the whole of the Glenfield Tunnel, the state of the passengers. They were covered in soot. So the train stopped around here somewhere. The passengers were able to clean themselves off in the brook on that inaugural railway journey. So we're just walking underneath the Church Lane Bridge, which I think was rebuilt in... I think it's in 1994. 1994. We're heading up the Swannington Incline, so we're heading sort of back south again. Now for me this is a hugely exciting period of history. Um, there was no formulation for building railways like this, and especially no formulation for how to carry a passenger, which were often a second thought to the railway engineers of the time. They really didn't have any forethought that the, there would be a demand, but there was. So the early railway pioneers of that time often treated their railway like they did a canal. So a good example of that is also the Cromford and High Peak Railway, built I think about two years prior to this one. And they treated it like a canal in the respect of they didn't know how to tackle uh, gradients, so they would do a canal section, which we would call it, is exactly flat. Then they would have an incline, and then flat, and then incline. That's how they tackled hills rather than a slow gradient. And this is a great example. We're walking up now the Swannington Incline, and it's one in 17, it's one of two on this line. Just up there, you can also see um, what was an ancient trackway called Pitlay's Lane. Yep. And they changed the name to Potato Lane. Potato Lane. <laughs> and I guess that's a kind of. I, I wonder that. if that's um, just like lost in dialect. Do you remember um, the Hucky Duck Aqueduct we did? Oh, yeah. Apparently, no one could say the word aqueduct. Yes. So they all just called it Hucky Duck. Duck. So I wonder if that was the kind of thing where it was Maybe. Pitlay's Lane got turned into Potato Lane, perhaps. <laughs> Now, in order to get trains up those inclines, they would use a static engine. And that static engine that used pistons would it still survive today in the National Rail Museum. It does. And there's all sorts of things up here. There's lots of plaques that people have put up, or societies have put up. Whoa, that's not the front door. And um, yeah, <laughs> there's a building just here, which is obviously laid out as in terms of perhaps the way it was back in the railway day. Who knows, I don't know, there's, there's all sorts here. There's no signs, ironically, for this bit. Oh look, there's a well down there. Um, and all sorts of engineering bits and pieces. We need a local guide, or we need to read the sign that's over there. <laughs> right, so what, what are we saying, Rebecca? Well, that used to be the engine house. So the whole building was the engine house? Massive engine house, which was obviously dismantled when everything was dismantled. Um, it, was, it was demolished, um, but the long-term aim of the trust is to rebuild it and reinstate the winding engine to, into its original place. That'd be fantastic. That'd be epic, wouldn't it? I feel like it's been quite a while since we stood on some track, some abandoned or disused mm. track. I don't remember the last time. Not a lot in this country, is there? But right ahead of us is a beautiful stretch of track going towards mm. Spring Lane. So this has been the Swannington and Leicester Railway and it's been a really interesting journey, the research behind it as well, because it really tells the story of the early railway and how they had no sort of blueprint, no formal blueprint of how they were doing this. They underestimated the demand for passengers and it was led by the industry as it often was, mm -hmm. but, and yeah, turned out to be a successful railway. Yeah, hopefully you've enjoyed this little jaunt from Rebecca and I. Um, if you like the videos we do, click on subscribe. We'll see you next week, people. Thanks for watching. Uh, goodbye.